You know, guys, that quantum computing makes changing in every aspect of society: our way of living, transportation, architecture, development sector, construction sector, and the technology sector, even mass communication, the consumer retailer sector, and uh, especially the medical sector. If we have quantum computer today, so we can definitely find out the solution of coronavirus easily. Also, finance sector, quantum computer makes easy economics forecasting, complex risk analysis, time series analysis, and the most most important that is your defense security system. If you have a quantum computer, no one can harm your security because quantum computer have vast vast application in the cyber security. So the thing is that, and the question arises: What is quantum computing? right and uh, how does it works as i already told you that it works on the principle of superposition and our, our, we have a speakers on it who will explain your work and when we can expect it google says it takes approximately 1000 years for welcoming our quantum computers in our home okay So the most dangerous thing that I feel about is that it gets in wrong hands. Only one way to hack into yours. Computers. So about the quantum computing, that is for science. So, for example, uh, right now this session has been conducted by with the collaboration of CPE. Let's talk about what is CPE. CPE is a Center of Physics Education. Is the organization. to promote conceptual understanding of physics among students and teachers as well in 1991 professor abdul salam who is a nobel laureate had agreed to be the founding patron in chief of the cpe the cpe represented pakistan at aspian icwip international commission on women in physics for conceptual understanding of physics the cpe has designed strategies based on active learning method since 1985 CPE has been organizing conferences, seminars and workshops at international, national and local level as well. CPE activities have been appreciated and supported by the Abdul Salam International Center for the Theoretical Physics, UNESCO, ASEAN Asian Physics Educational Network that is has abbreviation and PAEC and Sparco as well. Right now we are really glad and honored to have a team of cpe right now with us dr kila islam who is the chairman former uh, chairman of cpe and the former principal government college for women and former professor dean science kk international university gilgit secretary general aziz fatma hasnan former we are also glad and have honored that aziz fatma is also with us right now in this session aziz fatma hasnan former professor of the government college for women npc of asian physics education network aspian and former country team leader of international commission on women in physics icwip from 2008 to 2014 now let's talk about quantum computing club because the cpe is the center of physics education who is working in the uh, uh, conceptual research on the physics and qcc uh is not an organization right now it it is just a we are the group of students of nedd uet that is the nedd university of engineering and technology and i am also belong from quantum computing club our society quantum computing club uh is not registered yet due to this pandemic situation but the quantum computing club without taking any rest and coming out from its comfort zone creating events webinars and sessions on quantum computing Recently, our quantum computing members have won Advanced Quantum Challenge 2020 and become certified Advanced Quantum Badge holder by IBM. And right now, today we have the two speakers, uh, Mohammad Bidad Khan and Ikra Naz. They both have IBA Quantum Badge holder 2020. Okay, let's talk about our mission to spread the knowledge about quantum computing. It's our first mission, and the second mission for our quantum computing club has. Uh, to provide a platform for collaborative learning between researchers and students, and the third one to research in the field of quantum computing, to develop projects in the field of quantum computing. So that is all our missions right now. And uh, now this is time to invite our speaker Muhammad Migdad Khan 
who is going to elaborate you uh, and explain you and have a session with you on introduction to quantum computing. Okay, Mohammed Migdad Khan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Please uh, allow me to share my screen. I'm going to make you host, okay? Okay. Right. Grace Migdad Khan. Mohammed Migdad Khan, okay. you are now host, okay? okay? But now the over is you. Okay. Okay, is my screen is visible to all of you? Yes, sir, it is visible. Yes, you can see. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad Migdad Khan and my today's topic is introduction to quantum computing. Uh, if I talk, uh, talk about myself, so I belong to the physics department of NED University. And I also the advanced quantum badge holder of IBM. IBM. Okay, and I uh, I write several research papers uh, in, in the quantum computing research papers. Okay. With what is quantum computing? Uh, wait a minute. What is quantum computing? Quantum computing. Uh, with the definition of quantum computer, a quantum computer is a machine which uses the laws of quantum mechanics to do the tasks of computing. I mentioned the name of quantum uh, quantum computer uh, quantum mechanics here. So, what is quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics is a study of the behavior of these atomic particles. So, what we get a quantum computer is a device which uses the uh, behavior of the sub particles to do the tasks of computing. Okay, if I talk about the history of quantum computing, so once upon a time, Feynman uh, said that if he say nobody can understand the quantum mechanics, then he, then in 1982, Feynman proposed the idea of creating machines based on the laws of quantum mechanics. And in 1985, David, uh, David developed the quantum Turing machine. And then in 1994, Peter Shor came up with the quantum algorithm. And then in 1997, Lowe uh, Grover developed a quantum search algorithm. Why we bother quantum computation? Because according to Moore's law, uh, a transistors on a, on a chip uh, is doubling uh, uh, by every year or by every two year. So with the by the year of uh, 2010 and 2020, we have reached the uh, 100 million transistors on a single chip. So we are, uh, and we see the announcement by the Apple, they are going to make a transistors uh, of three nanometer arm. So we already hit the quantum level. And we know that the uh, the, uh, the lowest possible range of our transistor arm is the 1.5 nanometer. So in the next 10 years, we will reach the quantum level. So at that level, we will be unable to uh, to re reduce more de these sizes. So that's why we need the quantum com computer, and we need the com more computation power day by day. As I uh, give you the example of uh, my computer, when I was start, uh, when I start using the computer, then I start with the Pentium 2. Now I am using the Core i5, as you all know the uh, processors of these type. And we know that uh, these computation powers are not enough. So we uh, use the GPUs and tensor processing for different tasks. And these are also not enough for the humankind computation so the representation of qubits a bit so we will uh, i uh, talk about the qubit with the comparison of bit 
a qubit is the uh, is uh, is like a like a bit in the sense of input and output and uh, like it takes the input in the form of zero and gives the output in the form of zero and one like bit does but it is different in the form of processing like uh, they uh, it will go in the superposition and other mechanical laws here is the uh, uh, how can we zero and one the, uh, these are shows here presentation and the computation power of the qubit then here is the relation of the uh, of this the, as n qubits is equal to 2 to the power of, uh, n of classical bits it means that uh, qubit, uh, qubits has the exponentially in, exponential increase increment in the power okay Let's talk about the uh, uh, representation of bit uh, as a foot, uh, as a photonic bit. This is the single photonic source, and this is the one source. So the photonic source. Here we use the switchable uh, switchable mirror. Uh, wait a minute. Some part participants are in waiting room. I'm admitting them. Here is the switchable mirror. If uh, if the mirror is at this state, then there will be the one, uh, and if the mirror at this sta state, then there will be the zero. And if I talk about the photonic qubit, then here is the thing. We use the half silvered mirror. In the half silvered mirror, there is the fifty percent possibility to the uh, pass it away and uh, it will give in give the form of zero and the 50 percent possibility it will go the uh, go and give us the and that it will go in the superposition and it can give a zero and one remember remember it is superposition is the quantum mechanic and uh, and if you want to read the qubit we have to destroy its superposition state we can only read zero and one so uh, before reading we destroy the uh, their superposition state okay there are the some represent like circular uh, representation like zero and one and with the, uh, the here is the some other notation as fi filling the circle with color as it as there is the 50 percent possibility of zero and one and the phase shifting and angle shifting this is the thing we call the blotch sphere and this is the most important representation and this is the standard representation of the qubits now application of quantum computing as Shabazz discussed many applications, uh, most uh, uh, I am discussing them also. Machine learning. Machine learning. Uh, as uh, computer persons know that they, uh, when they uh, they use the artificial intelligence and machine learning, they need more and more computation power. As when uh, machine learning, I uh, sometimes I use my CPU and sometimes I use the and sometimes uh, uh, get the uh, X of tensor processing this tensor processing unit is also not enough now we need the quantum computation for ma machine learning tasks and genomic sequencing as we know that uh, in genomics there is a lot of data and we have to handle the data and in the normal computation genomics is not easy to do uh, not easy to do it takes years of Uh, we are unable to uh, make the uh, make the vaccine early because of the genomic sequencing and the genetical data etc with the help of quantum computation we can do it very quickly and chemical information like nicotine and uh, drugs making the most important uh, application of quantum computation is the true random number generation the true random number generation because uh, the quantum computer goes in this superposition state so we we will uh, we don't know what will be the next state as uh, they can make the true random numbers they can generate the true random numbers and uh, that normal computer uh, computer can't do in this uh, we always predict the uh, computation but in this situation we cannot predict if I give you the example with the coin flipping when uh, of the qubit state uh, of uh, superposition, 
when I flip the coin, so, uh, while flipping the coin, sometimes it is in the state, uh, state of head and sometimes it is in the state of tail. I can say that sometimes it is in the state of zero and sometimes it is in the state of one and sometimes it is in the state of erection. So at that, at that time, this superposition state as there is the 50-50% chances that it, it will be in the zero state and it will be in the one state. And while flipping, sometimes the coin is uh, with some angles, uh, this, this, can, this is the analogy to, analogy to the uh, percentage of the uh, prob probability. Like with the true random, uh, with the help of true random number generation, there is the most important application is the security. Like uh, as uh, if we want to break the security, then classical computer try it, uh, try uh, try it all possibility one by one. But quantum computer can do many tasks uh, in a single run, so it will try the all of the possibilities at once. That's why th this is threat, threat to our defense and the cryptography so it is also the uh, also the uh, very applicable in the defense and cryptography uh, for the public key encryption and other encryptions as well now i am going to show you some other uh, things uh, so i'm uh, stop sharing now okay share another screen wait a minute Okay, this is the uh, this is a uh, simulator of quantum computation. As there is there I uh, there is the written program is the random bit. Random bit. When I run this program, I really don't know what will be the output of this program. Uh, either it is one or either it is zero. I really don't know. So we can run it. See, here is the one, and here is the circular notation. Circular notation as we discussed in in previous slides and if I run it again, I really don't know again what will be the next Again one and again it is one. I run it again and again it is one. Now it is zero. I really don't know what is uh, uh, Next again. This is the simulator not the real computation If I do it on the random byte Then you can easily see that I only use the three gates uh, and uh, on, only use the three lines of quantum computation and this makes the byte a byte with the eight bits. Here is the uh, here is the result one one zero one 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 zero and one. If I run it again, I really don't know what will be the next. So here is the result zero zero one zero 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 one zero. If I run it again, here is the next result. Okay. If I may sound you like that quantum computers are the killer of the classical computer, but this is not the true quantum computers are not the killers of classical computers as quantum computers are the specialized computer special purpose computer. So they are not good in everything like pixel by pixel generation of the image quantum computer uh, quantum computers make the errors in that because of the uh, quantum mechanical phenomena like uh, uh, and the probabilities, probabilities it uh, there will be the noise in the picture so that's why the, these are uh, these are the special purpose computer and uh, specialized tasks are uh, very important and uh, i may hear uh, i may sound you like that uh, the, these all are fantasy no the, the quantum computers has been happening and uh, developed by the ibm so you have to just search on IBM quantum experience and there are some website web links and uh, if uh, you can uh, see my new tab. Hello. Yes, we can see that. Okay. And here is the IBM's quantum website. Now here you can launch your IBM quantum experience. You can make your own IBM quantum experience on IBM take your uh, your access to the, to the real quantum experience and quantum backends okay here is my backend here is my dashboard here are some facilities provided by the ibm like qiskit notebook what is qiskit i qiskit the programming language of quantum computation and uh, it is the high level api of python if you want to program the Kis uh, the quantum 
is uh, to learn the uh, first. Uh, and if you don't know the Python, then there is no uh, there is no problem. As in the in our series of uh, webinars, we will discuss the Qiskit with the very basic. Like I can generate a new notebook as we can generate it in the Jupyter notebook. I already generated, so I can open it with here. It will take some time. This will be, this is my notebook. There are uh, some basic libraries already uh, already imported by the uh, by the IBM Quantum Experience. It gives us in the our series of webinar we will dis discuss how we can install the Qiskit on our local computer and on our Google Colab also. It is uh, as I discussed. It is the similar to the Python. So I write the uh, print hello world program like so. I will write here the print. Hello, quantum world. And when I run this cell, it it gives me the output. Oh, I made a mistake. Hello with three L's. Yeah. Hello, quantum world. It is similar to the Python. We will discuss how can how we can make the circuits on it and uh, to do other things and how we can get the access of real quantum computation to run the uh, real quantum backend to run our programs in our series of webinars. Also, IBM gave us the circuit composer. Circuit composer, new circuit. Here the. Uh, here, uh, here is this uh, uh, quantum logic gates, which will be discussed by the our next speaker. And what what are these details? Here we can uh, in the circuit composer we can drag and drop gates and make the circuit what uh, as what I what we want. And we can run it by save uh, saving it and then run it. When we run it, it it asks us the uh, how many shots we want. As we discussed, the uh, quantum computation runs on the uh, laws of quantum mechanics. So we know the quantum uh, in the quantum mechanics, the uh, real results cannot be achieved in a single run. We have to take multiple shots. So that's why we will take here the multiple shots. And it is recommended to not take a uh, only single shot. There are several uh, shots in uh, default. By, uh, I take it on uh, call, and there are. Some backends as I am using in the circuit composer is the chasm simulator and some other simulators also. You can this whole website by your own with the sign up at the IBM's quantum experience and making your ID. If I run it, it will go on the IBM's backend with, with the help of cloud and when it uh, and when the job will be done, it will show in the results. In the results, uh, as this is uh, complete, completed my job, and few seconds ago, if I will open it, it will take some time. Yeah, it, it is the circuit, and it is the transpiled circuit. Transpiled circuit will be a little bit differ uh, with the original circuit in the bigger circuits. That we uh, I use here the edge gate. Edge gate is the gate which uh, with the, the basic gate of the quantum computation, and it, uh, uh, it it makes the qubit in this superposition state, and it is the very useful gate in the quantum computation. It is uh, uh, the details will be discussed by Ikranas, and uh, here are the result. Their results of the chasm simulator is shown in the histogram. We will discuss the histo uh, what are the meanings of histogram in our. Series of webinars and in our next webinar. Okay, okay. Uh, that's Thank all from my know. side. Thank you very much. Now I am making the host to the Ikran Naz and she will discuss uh, more things. Okay. Ikra, you are host now and you can continue. Ikra. Uh, just a minute. Okay. Uh, if you have any queries, you can ask in the comment section. Hey guys, Assalamu Alaikum and a warm welcome to all of you in our first webinar. Let me introduce myself first. So, I'm Ikranas, a software engineering student at N University of Engineering and Technology. I'm IBM Quantum Challenge Advanced Batch Holder and a Quantum Computing Researcher. My first research paper on quantum computing entitled as Reduction of Quantum Circuits by Using HUH Sandwich Technique with Diagonal Matrix Implementation is on the way to its publication in a repeatable science journal. It was little about me. 
let's move towards our topic so you can see on my uh, screen that the title of my presentation is quantum gates so we'll learn about single qubit representation quantum logic gates uh, gates notation gates matrices gates plot square representation and much more um so let's move quickly towards our first topic that's classical bit versus qubits okay so um all of you know about classical bits that is 0 and 1 1 and 0 and the whole computation of our conventional computers works on bits okay Uh, so in comparison with classical bits we have qubits in quantum computing qubits can be zero qubits can be one it can be zero and one at the same time and can be superposition of zero and one so on and it's quite interesting about qubits and qubit is almost all about quantum computing now uh, let's move towards our main topic that's quantum gates um sorry okay um so before uh talking on quantum gates uh, let's have a look on quantum circuits uh you can see in uh, classical computers they are composed of different circuits and those circuits are composed of logic gates like and or and some of you who are from a uh, computer science background or like uh, engineering background and so on i uh, know about logic gates and um most of it so um we can uh, say quantum circuits as a a quantum circuit is a computational routine consisting of coherent quantum operations so um it's a routine of quantum operations on quantum data basically it's a sequence of quantum gates that perform real time computations so we can say that quantum circuits comprise of quantum gates now the question is what are quantum gates what they do what are their applications and specifications and so on so without wasting time let's move towards quantum gates quantum gates are the building block of quantum circuits and they are basic quantum circuits that are that can be operated in small number of qubits and uh, the most interesting thing about quantum logic gates are that they are reversible it means if we apply two um, quantum gates in a series then they will uh, neglect the effect of one another and these gates can be represented by unitary matrices uh, you can google it by your own and can learn what unitary matrices and what's interesting in it so um you can see a lot of uh, a series of quantum gates here um don't worry i'll discuss all of these one by one we can categorize quantum gates into two categories on the basis of number of qubits used for input the, these are single qubit quantum gates and multiple qubit quantum gates single qubit quantum gates and um, single qubit quantum gates are those who use one input uh, one qubit as input and provide uh, output after their implementation these are hadamard gate poly gates phase shifter r5 gates identity s and t gates and general u gates so uh, first gate is hadamard gate Hadamard gate is the most important gate in quantum circuits, and it used to create superposition of zero and one states. Quantum uh, in quantum computing, Hadamard gate created rotation of around x axis by pi radians, that's one eighty degree, followed by a clockwise rotation of around pi by two radians around y axis. You can see the notation of Hadamard gate here and Hadamard matrix too. 
this is a blood sphere representation of hydromid gate. You can see it's the initial state of qubit that's in one with the phase zero degree. And after the implementation of hydromid gate to this qubit, it came into the superposition of zero and one. The second most important gate is polygate. Polygates consist of three most basic single qubit gates that are poly X gate, poly Y gate, and poly Z gate. Poly X gate is directly analogous to the classical NOT gate. It transforms 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. And if we see on the blood sphere, this gate is equivalent to the rotation of around x axis by pi radians. Here you can see Here you can see x, uh, wait. Here you can see the rotation of x gate and x matrices. Next is poly y gate. Similar to poly x gate, the y gate represents rotation of around y axis by pi radians. Y gate transforms 0 to iota i and 1 to minus iota i. Okay, uh, you can see the notation of poly y gate here, and here is the matrix of poly y gate. If you apply zero to this mat uh, matrix and uh, find the product of zero to this matrix, you will find that it will come to iota one. And if you apply one to this matrix, you will find that it will come to minus iota zero. The next is poly z gate. The Z gate is actually a special case of phase shift where phi is equal to pi, that is 180 degree. It represents a rotation of around the Z axis by pi radians. It has no effect on zero but transforms 1 to minus 1. You can see the notation of Z gate here and its matrices. The next gate is shifter gate. This is a family of single qubit gates that leave the basic state of zero and change and map one to exponential iota phi and qubit state to one. The probability of measuring a zero or one is unchanged after applying this gate because it just modifies the phase of quantum state. And this is equivalent to the tracing of horizontal circle line of latitude and blood sphere by pi radians. We'll see the blood sphere of this gate in our next slides. So here is the uh, in um, blue are the notation of phase shifter gate and its matrices. The next gate is identity gate. It's it is the gate that does nothing and its matrix is identity matrix. Here the question arises: if this gate does nothing, then why we consider it in quantum gates? Because we have some circuits that had no effect on the qubit state. And this gate is often used in calculation. Like uh, I um, discussed in the start that quantum gates are reversible. So how will we prove that the gates are reversible. If we, if I took the, uh, if I take the product of x gate matrix to x gate matrix, I'll find identity matrix to prove that they are inverse and they can, if, and they, uh, they can cancel the effect of one another. And sometimes in real hardware, we have to specify do nothing or non operation. That, uh, so, in these type of circuits, we use identity matrix as in as dagger gates. The phase shift as gates is a single qubit operation, and as gate is also known as phase gate or Z90 gate because it rotates the qubit to 90 degree around Z axis. And the conjugate transpose of S gate is known as S dagger gate. You can see in uh, below are the uh, matrices of S and S dagger gates. Similar to S and S dagger gates, there are T and T dagger gates which rotate qubit around uh, qubit space to pi by 4 
gradient. Uh, as you can see in the S gate, the T gate is also known as Z exponential one by four gate. The conjugate transpose of T gate is T dagger gate. You can see the matrices of T and T dagger gate and can relate it to S and S dagger, S dagger gates. The last single qubit uh, quantum gates is general U gates. General U gates are special cases of more general R5 gates. These include identity gate, Z gate, S and T gates. The U3 gate is the most general of all single qubit gates because it can represent any of these gates in the form of matrices if you put their angle and lambda and phi degree. We'll discuss all these notations and uh, different uh, difficult terms in our upcoming series, so don't worry about it. The next category of quantum gate is multiple qubit quantum gates. It includes swap gate, temporal gates, the falling CC0 gates, and Fredkin C swap gate. The swap gate swaps two qubits with respect to the bases 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. It is represented by the matrix given below. And you can find the notation of swap gate on the screen below. My most favorite gate is control gates. So let's discuss what they are. Control gates require at least one control and one target qubit. The gate in question will only operate on target qubit if the control qubit is in specific state. So let's see what is specific state and what's target qubit and what's the control qubit. So you can see in the diagram that control uh, one is the control bit and zero is the target bit. And the specific state is that if the control bit is one, then it will reverse the state of target bit. So you can see the control bit is one and target bit is zero. So due to the state of control bit that's one, the, the lower target bit is cha bit change its state to one. There are three types of control gates, that is CX gate, CY gate, and CZ gate. So CX gate leaves the control qubit unchanged and performs a poly X gate on the target qubit when the control qubit is in state one, leaves the target qubit unchanged when the control qubit is in state as we discussed before. Here you can see the notation of X gate, control X gate and its matrices. Same as control X gate, CY gate is another well used two qubit gate. Just as C not applied to Y to its target qubit when control in state of one, and control Y apply a Y in the same case. And similar to CX and CY, control Z gate is another well used two qubit gate. And just uh, as the, um, C not gate applied to X in Y, all of you please mute yourself. Then they come to poly gate, that's three qubit gate with two controls and one target. It performs an act on the target only if both controls are in state of Ikram. Find state of targets then equal to their Ikra, sorry for interruption. Uh, Ikra, can you hear me? Ikra, can you hear me? Of a control, control not, and also for the CX gate. Second gate. Ikra, can you hear me? Control swap gate. Ikra, can you hear me? Please uh, make sure that uh, those people who are making a noise, please uh, mute their mics. Um, Go to the participants and read me one. Please mute her mic. Read me mic or remove remove her from this session. Uh, participants, please mute your mic as it's so, scared, it's scared in disturbance. Thank you. Uh, read read me one. Read me one. Please mute her mic. Okay, okay, you can you can also. Redkin gate. It's okay, controlled swap gate. It only swaps the value of the second and third bits 
only if the if the first bit is set to one. It's also a reversible gate. Okay, so with the Fredkin gate, we end up all the key, all the quantum gates, and here is the blood sphere blood sphere representation of various gates. You can see on the top uh, left there is the qubit initial state of one, and the, when we apply x gate to it, it changes its state to zero. Same as at initial state one, when we apply h gate to the qubit in state one, it forms in superposition of zero and one. And after the qubit came to superposition, we can apply as s dagger gate and t t dagger gate and so on. We'll discuss the blood sphere, the representation of these gates, and we will apply these gates and uh, we'll have a workshop on it in our upcoming series. So don't worry if you find any difficulty of understanding it. You can also contact us on our, our, our page. So uh, my topic is end. If you have any queries, uh, you can contact us. You'll, you can find my slide at SlideShare um, on my LinkedIn. Uh, the link is provided in chats. And uh, uh, here are some references uh, of um, the material which had to make my slides. Okay, uh, that's all from my side. And the uh, I'll end up here. And further will be discussed by our guest speaker, Ma'am Nazish, who is an executive member of CP. So hand over to you, ma'am. I'm just making you host. That's all from my side. Okay, thank you, Ikra. Okay, let me figure out how to share my screen. Uh, wait, ma'am. I'm just making you host. Okay. So uh, you can share your screen. Now we can see your screen and you can start now, ma'am. Obviously not a, a person with quantum computing. I am a physicist, so uh, pardon me if there is a lot of physics in, in between. So let's share, that's why there is a warning there. So I've been invited to talk about the physics behind quantum computing. Uh, introduction is I'm not Fatima. I'm currently residing at in UK for my research uh, at University of Hull. I'm also a member of Center for Physics for a long time now. Uh, also, uh, I have been teaching physics for the last 16 years uh, at St. Joseph's College for Women Karachi and now. Uh, at Upwa uh, Government College for uh, Women Karachi. So that's my introduction. And this is the title of my uh, presentation after a dazzling presentation about quantum computers and qubits and quant uh, technicality of uh, quantum computing. Uh, I, I have decided to make it a little bit simple. So that you can understand what's going on behind all that uh, fancy computing of quantum, quantum computers. So we'll be talking about basic physics, that is quantum physics. And uh, yes, I can understand that uh, while when uh, the name quantum physics comes up in, the, in mind or when you hear the word quantum physics, it's all gloomy because uh, most of us do not actually understand, not only us, all the scientists and physicists in the world, they actually did accept it that they do not completely understand the concepts of quantum physics. So to make it a little bit simple, let's see, uh, I'm not going to talk about fancy machines and uh, uh, the hardware behind quantum computing. So 
let's start with basic term that is called quantum physics. We, when we hear the word quantum physics, we go, obviously, the first thing that comes in our mind is the atom. So atom is the smallest particle and uh, that is what is building our universe. So with the names come up for us in quantum physics, that is Niels Bohr, Einstein, Schrodinger, we have all studied about uh, uh, studied the laws related and uh, devised by designed by these scientists and i have this okay how do i collapse this screen uh, so that you can see it okay how do i uh, change the screen please okay okay now i can try all right so this is the code that I uh, uh, actually like from Niels Bohr. If a quantum mechanics, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. So that's what quantum physics is all about. If you do not understand it, you go blank. You don't uh, say you don't know anything about what is quantum. So let's make it a little bit easy. Uh, let's suppose if I travel to a conference. Let's say if I say I traveled to a conference yesterday, the conference was this, not this webinar, it was a physical conference that I have to fly to. So yesterday after arriving at the airport, if I tell you that I entered into a left and exited on two floors at the same time, you might uh, just think the or doubt about my sanity. And then I, Again, see that I said, uh, then I bought ticket to uh, got on the plane to Toronto and to Singapore simultaneously. My uh, some of my friends greeted me in Singapore. I never did arrive in Toronto. You, are, you will again doubt my sanity. That's what classical science tells us. That's what classical science blind us to. But if I say that I was a photon or an electron and go to a quantum level, then it might not be that much unusual uh, than it was before if we, I, if we compare it to the classical reality. So that's what is the difference between the classical and quantum level is. Quantum physics may seem like it is strange to us, may seem like it is very difficult that we cannot understand because it is a human nature reality that if you cannot see anything, it is hard for us to believe that. If we cannot understand anything, as quantum physics goes to the level of quanta, goes to the level of small subatomic particles, if we cannot see them, it doesn't mean that they do not exist. So that's what a quantum physics is all about. And that's what uh, the physicists have discovered over the century that you go down to a real, if you go down to a very, very small scale up to uh, nanoparticles, up to picoparticles, up to cosmic, small cosmic particles, <laughs> even smaller than the atom and subatomic particles, really weird and unexpected things start to happen, which are not understandable by classical physics, by classical approach of science, so the scientists have developed a very new field or new field for science to try and explain those weird phenomena that happen when you go to a small atomic level. And they named it quantum mechanics. So what exactly is the difference between quantum physics and classical physics? Let's go back to the classical physics first classical physics that we st uh, study throughout our student life says that waves and particles are two different things. They're not similar different things. Particle behave, particle have mass, particle have velocity, particle have acceleration, while wave have interference, wave have speed, but interfere, they behave like uh, interfere, uh, 
in the way that is called interference, diffraction, reflection, and properties like that. So classical physics keep two phenomena or two things that are called wave and particles separately side by side. If we talk about a particle, a particle in a classical mechanics, a particle can exist or cannot exist. I'm emphasizing on or here uh, because in a classical mechanic, there is a notation of or in between can and cannot. Also, in, a cl in classical physics, a particle can be a position, it uh, can be at position A or at position B. And classical physics also tells us that in terms of diffraction, superposition, reflection, refraction, etc., they are all properties of wave and they are not associated with the particle. Then there comes the wave particle duality, and then we go to quantum physics. Quantum physics says that there is a wave associated with every particle. And there's a difference between two statements. A particle can exist and cannot exist as at the same time. This is the charm of quantum physics that it does not reject even the central part of the motion. So the particle can exist and cannot exist at the same time. The quantum physics says that a particle can be at position A and at position B at the same time. This is what makes quantum physics alien for most. Because if you see uh, uh, as a common sense, you cannot exist at po two positions at the same time. But quantum physics says that this is true. This can happen if you go and reach up to that level. How does that happen? The de Broglie's hypothesis that wave, there is a wave associated with each and every particle according to quantum physics. So that wave, when a particle A, move, a particle moves from a position A to a position B like this, the wave associated with that particle is, comes into motion, comes into action, and fills the gap between A imposing, interfering, and make it possible for a particle to be at both position at the same time unless the measurements are done at a particular space. This is what we see about class, uh, waves, particle, waves and particles in our classical mechanics. These are the pictures from your uh, normal uh, classical physics books. There is wave, this particle, they are separated by uh, the uh, fact that they are separate. Interference of waves, uh, waves can interfere with each other, waves can superimpose upon each other. When, they, when two waves combine, they either cancel each other, they either uh, cancel each other or they uh, become a big strong wave and add up to the uh, strength of the energy of the wave. Interference of light. I consider in classical mechanics, the light is considered as a wave. So interference is the property of a wave phenomena. So light can interfere, light can diffract, light can superimpose upon each other. Now here, this is the breakthrough point of physics between classical and mechanical. We know that light is made up of photons. Light is, light is a particle, if photons are a particle, but the behavior of light by experiments show that the that light is also behaving or photon is also behaving as a wave. So this leads to the wave particle duality theory. Now let's make it more simple from our daily life examples. Everyone, each and every one of you use smartphones, mobile phones, and we know that the mobile phones are connected to the satellites, several satellites that are revolving around our universe. Okay, so these are the satellites. If you can see the picture, there are several satellites at a time revolving around our Earth and uh, orbiting our Earth for the communication purpose. So if we have our mobile phone, if it is a smartphone, we all know that when we open the map of our mobile phone exactly know where we are. 
like all the time. It can detect your position, your exact location, and it is so much precise. Often, sometimes you can find a person through their mobile phone within the range of meters. This is so, that's how precise it is. And how, and sometimes the question do come in uh, people's mind that how does this phone, uh, how does our phone do that? How does it detect that where we are exactly? So our quest, simple answer will be, that is a common sense answer that uh, obviously it is because global positioning system or that we call it GPS as short. What does the GPS do? Let's say, at any time, for example, there are about 24 and 20, 32 working GPS at the same time, satellites uh, that are working at the same times and orbiting uh, the Earth roughly at the altitude that is about like here, 20,000 kilometers. That's a rough def distance, uh, plus or minus. And if your phone can receive signals from those satellites, you can actually find the distance of your phone or device by finding out how long the light or signals are being traveling through those satellites. So what happens here is that the satellite knows where they are. They have their own log position here. So they know where they are relative to Earth in turn. And in turn, they also, when you start looking for your location they tell your phone that where these satellites are they can detect the distance and the time delay in receiving those messages from satellite to your phone determines or gives away the distance of satellite from your phone so this uh, if you want to find out the distance you need to multiply time by the speed of flight and that will give you the distance of satellite. Now, if you know the distance of four satellites, roughly, if we select four uh, random satellites for, uh, uh, from the orbit, and if we know the distance of these four satellites, and uh, it allows your phone to calculate and establish the exact location of where your phone, where you exactly are. That's how the GPS work. Now, uh, let's go towards a little bit quantum precision of GPS. Uh, you must have heard about quantum clocks, by, uh, clocks and uh, these are now in use and these are not a new thing anymore. So we know that the speed of light is about uh, 30 centimeter in one nanosecond. So in, uh, if you want to get your location down within a meter, the error, if it is, if, the light traveling is in nanosecond, then the delay can be only for a few nanosecond. That, that doesn't give you a very large amount of error, so it's negligible. Now, uh, for a normal clock, it is impossible to get that much precision. So we need much more precise device to uh, calculate the time so that's why we have atomic clocks. That's why there was need to devise atomic clocks. So how are these atomic clocks are made of cesium-133 atoms? And if you can see the radiation, if uh, here I will a little uh, emphasize a little bit how the radiation is produced. It is produced an atom jump from a ground state to the excited state or in simple word when it the atom changed its state from ground to excited excited to ground it released the radiation so if you can see that if a cesium atom produced radiation which is exactly this much this large amount of cycles per second so you can imagine that how fast it uh, that procedure is so to calculate how uh, the cesium atom jumps between two states, if we want to find out uh, the time between two states, it is very small. And you can uh, use the cesium atom clock uh, to calculate this time. And this takes us again back to quantum mechanics. So the quantum clocks that are used by GPS system satellites, they are made up of uh, 
made up of cesium atom and when we talk about atoms and it calculates or the time or calculates the tick of the clock by the trans by calculating the transition state or transition between two states of one atom of cesium 133 so it's as simple as that you know where you are on the surface of earth on the planet every time you check your phone's map or you open google map and this is only possible because of quantum mechanics that's what Heisenberg, I uh, quite like this quote because uh, Heisenberg, this is one sentence that completely defines how vast our universe and how vast our life is, how, com how difficult it is to know everything about everything. So at some point he said that not only is the universe stranger than we think, it is stranger than we can think. Now the second thing that I would like you uh, to know about uh, going towards the quantum computing uh, especially the second thing that has changed our life is transistors and we know this is the circuit board of a said normal mobile phone and these uh, transistors are the result of quantum mechanics as well and they are very good practical example to understand the quantum physical phenomena go, uh, that goes on inside an atom what are transistors? We all know what transistors are by now. They are tiny devices, few of tons of nanometer size. They are typically made up of any kind of semiconductors like silicon, gallium arsenide, or uh, some other new materials. The basic working of transistor is a fast current, current switching in microchips. So if they can switch between two currents, in a, in a nanosecond's time or nanoscale time, then they can be made to perform logic operation, which is the basis of our computing world. And if you can see your mobile phones, uh, you open the motherboard or the circuit board of your mobile phone, what happens is that you can see a typical circuit board with billions of transistor and uh, embedded on the circuit board. Now, if you can see, we are uh, taking benefits and we are enjoying the benefits from quantum mechanics in our daily lives and we don't even really know about that it is because of qu quantum physics. While the quantum physicists in our world are working out how to build the next big thing, And what can be the next big thing? Like uh, the speakers previously, they gave a very dazzling and very informative uh, presentation about the quantum computers. So why, why don't we just talk about uh, computers? What is the physics behind quantum computers? So the quantum physicists, they're working to build systems related to quantum mechanics and use the phenomena or fast switching phenomena of quantum physics to build up new things that are fast and efficient enough, like computers. So this is how uh, where it gets interesting and a little bit understandable for a uh, common uh, public as well. Now, there are main things that we have to uh, understand about quantum computing because quantum computing focuses on the principle of quantum theory and being a physicist, I, am, uh, I will again go towards a lot of physics behind this. So quantum theory, it deals with modern physics obviously and it, it explains the behavior of matter and energy of an atomic uh, energy of an atom at subatomic level. So we come again back to the matter and energy, which are the basic building blocks of life. So if we are dealing with matter and energy, it means that we are dealing with the whole universe. Also, we want to uh, uh, understand how quantum computing use physics, quantum physics, in order to do a successful work. So the phenomena, I will not go through the details and complicated science and equations and mathematics behind quantum physics. I will only highlight a few simple 
a phenomena that occurs when we study or while we pay attention to modern uh, quantum physics. So quantum bits, superposition that uh, our young uh, speakers uh, talked about quantum bits in, uh, in quite a bit detail. So I will only go through the uh, important physics of these. Superposition, entanglement, uh, and uh, you can say interference to perform the data operation. All right, so let's discuss the difference between what is a conventional computer, what is the difference between conventional computing and quantum computing. And in order to understand computing, let's go what are conventional computer and what are quantum computers. Okay, so uh, when we talk about conventional computers, we talk about bits. What exactly bits are? The bits are the small switching of circuit or a small switching of signal between zero, one, or in simple word, uh, you can say on and off, and that be makes up the binary digits that is zero and one. We call on one and we call off zero. So if we decode the system of bits or decode the signal of bits on our computer, it will complete the binary system here and that gives rise to the Boolean algebra that we study about the con uh, conventional computing. So this is the standard that was develop, uh, developed in 19th century by George Bull to understand the uh, language of computing. Now, in conventional computing, bit is an, uh, is an idea or it's a concept in which the system can be either in one of the two states. Either it can be on or it can be in off a state. Okay. So, uh, the system is on or off, it is either in one state on, uh, or another. You might be thinking, where is the quantum physics? Uh, let, wait for a while. When uh, we go move forward to the quantum part of this phenomena, for, now let's take an example for light bulb. If it is on, it can be either in one of two states. It can either be on, it can be off. It cannot be in between on and off. That's what our classical physics says. That's what our conventional computing says. So let's see this is the logic behind con conventional computing. Let's consider bulb A and bulb B. If bulb A is on, bulb B is off, we get a second, uh, we get an output off. We get one, we get zero, we get output zero, we get zero, we get one, we get output zero. So this is how a conventional computing bits are generated. If both bulbs are on, we get an on circuit. Now let's move to quantum mechanics. How uh, quantum mechanics defy the laws of Boolean logic for the computers. Now, for that, we have to go back to the CCM133 atom for the atomic clock. If you can see this picture, this is the conventional one and zero for the normal uh, classical computers. And according to classical mechanics, we cannot go back, uh, we cannot kind of join these two, one and zero together. So it has two states. For quantum clock, the cesium atom have two states. One is the ground state, that, you, uh, that is the basic concept of at atomic uh, radiation. So it, the two states, ground state and first excited states are responsible to re release the radiation. So let us consider th these two states only and neglect the other states within the atom. So the cesium atom, if we talk about one atom of cesium, uh, the ground state 
and the first excited state. So atom moves from the ground state when provided uh, some energy, it moves to their first excited state. And in doing so, it releases out a photon. It releases out energy in form of radiation. And if you capture that radiation, you can count it. And we can also call this, if we uh, take it to the computing strategies, we can call these two states zero and one. And we can consider these two states moving in these two between these two states as a tiny bit. A bit is composed of zero and one. But quantum physics says that it gives us more than zero and one. It gives us more than tiny bit. When an atom moves from a ground state to the excited state, it's not only at two positions at one at a time, but when it moves forward from one part to the other part or within the energy limit of the atom, it is uh, the wave associated with that particle superimpose and interfere within the uh, within that energy level during the movement of the atom from one state to the other state. So cesium atom, according to quantum mechanics, the atom can be in one of these two states and also in any quantum superposition of these two states, all right? So this is where our quantum physics comes about in quantum computing or in computing system. Now, let's talk about some basis of quantum physics. In a quantum computer, the basic unit of memory is called quantum bit. In normal classical computing, we call it a bit. In quantum computer, it is called quantum bit because this is actually a small, tiny quantum particle moving between two energy states. Uh, can you kindly mute your mic, please? Nazish Fatma, I think you have to go and mute them, Mike. All right, uh, how do you do that? Okay, participants, I can mute them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Okay, all right, so. In a quantum computer, the basic unit of memory is quantum bit as it is a tiny quantum particle and we call it qubit, which are made using physical systems that is spin off electrons. This is a whole bunch of uh, atomic physics and quantum physics going on behind all this. Quantum computer identify the movement of electron between the energy level. That's how it creates its qubits. The quantum computing is based on that nano and pico scale qubits, and it is not in nothing very fancy, just simply because of the phenomenon going on within the atom. It is simply the spin of electron, the normal uh, behind it, orientation of a photon, or the position of photon at the state, and we can arrange, make a lot of different arrangements for all these phenomena and that's how a quantum computer works at different tasks and multiple tasks all at the same time. And the property, this property of uh, spinning and orientation of a quantum bit within a same time limit is called quantum superposition. Now, as you can see the picture here, I will not go through the details of the uh, qubit and bit differentiation. If you can see in normal, simple words, you can see that the zero is in orange color and uh, one is in blue color. In, in classical computing, this orange and blue are well separated by a distance or by a gap in between them. You cannot mix zero with one or one with zero. So the switching can uh, either be at zero or it can be at one. It cannot be at zero and one altogether. This is where the classical computing have its own limit. So this gap is considered as a blank area where 
no information is being transferred or delivered. While, as these computers do not use quantum clocks or do not use uh, the nanoscale level quantum, uh, quantum uh, movements, while if you go for the qubit, it's a zero and a one. So blue part, the blue part of one or on, you can see that it's a very good smooth mix or transition from one to zero. Classical physics says that if a particle moves from this point to this point, it is either at this point or at this point and there is nothing in between. While quantum physics says that if a particle moves from this point, one to point zero, the particle is at point one and is at point two both at the same time, can, both can be both at the same time. And there's no physical gap in between the movement because when particle moves, the wave associated with it moves along with it. And that wave superimpose interfere and uh, entangle in between to create a path for the information that can be carried and that can be processed within this gap as well. So this one transit smoothly into zero like this and there is no information gap in between. So quantum computers, that how quantum computing is way faster than a conventional or classical computing. Now let's go back to a little bit physics. I'm not going to uh, make you bored by all the quantum physical formulas and things like that. Just for your ground uh, information, uh, there are superposition states in quantum physics. When we talk about quantum computing here, qubits here, what is going on behind all this phenomena? So in quantum mechanics, we can have superposition in between the way from transitioning from zero to one or one to zero, the wave associated with the particle superimpose and the particles can be in two states at the same time simultaneously. So this is how a single photon's go, go for state A, state B and phi represent the wave function and it is called the state of system. So when photon, single photons move towards one state to the other state, it is either at A or at B or at uh, both uh, or at the both position at the same time. This is what the uh, quantum physics says. Because particles are associated with waves. So in quantum mechanics, we describe the particles as wave function. They are not separated by wave. They are so describe as wave function. So if you want to find the position of a particle at X, we will be using the probability and it is given by this function, P equal to phi X squared, this is called wave function probability. So if you can see, this is the simple double slit experiment. It gives out single atom, or at it beam of electron, let's say it's a double slit experiment, and then you split it into two halves, and they will give the same pattern, interference pattern on the screen. So the result, the resulted beams or resulting beam of atoms can, can give same interference effect of wave, no matter how many slits you make to split them apart. Now, that was all the fancy uh, physics stuff back in the previous slide. How do we exactly know the position of photon or what the state of photon is? Or how do we confirm that photon is really in both the states at the same time? So this is the experimental arrangement to uh, understand the movement of a photon between two states. If you can see, this is a beam splitter. The photon is incident on the beam splitter one part of photon is reflected to the mirror one. These are two mirrors. And these mirrors are divided to produce two states A and B. The first phase 
is phi f5 1 so photon reflects to the mirror one and half part of the photon is reflect refracted through the beam splitter to phase two and after reflecting back from the mirror this goes back and after reflecting back from the phase one this part goes back here so the photon is at state A, it, it is at state B, and due to the reflection in between the transition process, it is both at state A and state B at the same time as well. So the output wave phase is the sine wave like this, and this is cos squared five one plus five two, this is the phase angle that is given for. This is the experimental setup to prove that the photon is really in both states at the same time. Now, this is one thing that is an interesting, uh, you can say, interpretation. It was given in 1930 in Copenhagen, in a Danish city, uh, by Niels Bohr, Heisenberg, and a couple of other scientists. They suggested that uh, there really is, if you can emphasize on this sentence, uh, if you can see my cursor, there really is no definitive reality before the measurement and the object is in defined state known as a superposition. Now, what does this really mean? It means that nothing exists until you measure it or nothing exists until you see it from one end or one single point. So what we do in real, in classical uh, platform, we select a point, we do the measurement and we find the parameters related to that measurement. But quantum physics says that you cannot say what is real unless you do the measurement. And if you do not do the measurement, then the system is said to be in a state of superposition. That superposition state can be anything. So according to superposition state, a particle must be here a particle can't be here, but there is a phase in between which is real and particle is actually here. So it is moving from here to here. So the principle of quantum superposition simply says that the quantum particle can exist in two distinct locations at the same time according to this according to the theory. And a quantum particle can exist simultaneously in multiple states. It can be at two positions at the same time and it can be in two dif distinctive states simultaneously or in the mul in multiple states unless you do the operation of measurement or unless you make the measurement for a specific instant. This is how this part of quantum computing comes about. If a particle must be there, it should be on or it is true or one. If particle can't be there, according to classical computing, it is off or can't be there. But according to quantum, quantum computing, there is something in between which can be either one or zero or both. So this is the third part that makes quantum computing unique. So zero, is the normal classical zero, one is normal classical one, and this bit is the heart of quantum computing, where in between the transition of or movement of the particle or movement of the signal, there is something going on so that you can transfer much more data and information during the movement of the signal than you can you expected or than you can imagine uh, in classical computing. Now, just for a lighter uh, explanation of things, it is a very well-known and uh, fact that you cannot put a USB uh, in a socket unless you rotate it twice or thrice. So let us uh, assume that we are putting a USB cable in the computer port or USB port. We use this up position first, and then we realized that this was not a right position. We re rotated it, and we made it up to, into the down position. So these are two one and zero states. Either the USB position can be this or this. If we see the socket or in the computer, or if we see the port in the computer with our eyes, but unless we see it with our own eyes, the two positions are existing at the same time, it can be either one up position or down position at the same time. You cannot say unless you see 
then the superposition uh, then the position of usb cable is up or down so this state in which you cannot say which position it exactly is you believe that it is the superposition of both of the states so both can exist at the same time here now that reminds us of schrodinger's cat you might have all heard about schrodinger's cat it's kind of a brutal explanation of a simple quantum phenomena but what exactly happened is that uh, he imagined his cat in a box and he he thought of a phenomena that occurs if the cat is in a box is simply say that a cat is sitting in a cardboard box and the box is closed you cannot see if the cat is in there or not unless you open the box and see it the similar thing occurred to heisenberg and what he did he imagined a box containing a radioactive atom so because he was a quantum physicist so he cannot help doing that a vial of poison was also in there and a cat in the box. And according to quantum physics rules, if the radioactive atom decays, it can either decay or it cannot decay at the given moment. So you cannot see that if it will decay or not. But if it does decay, the idea was that the decay caused the vial to break, poison vial to break and release the poison and kills the cat. So, what he did, according to Copenhagen interpretation that I mentioned uh, in uh, last two, uh, in previous slide, that if it is correct, that unless you make the measurement, the item or the particle is in both states or particle is true and false at the same time, then before any measurement has occurred, the cat is also in a superposition state of being decayed or dead and not decayed and alive. So this is the pictorial representation of Schrodinger's cat. So there's the cat, there's a GM counter. If the radioactive material decays, the counter will count it, it will release the hammer, the poison vial will bro uh, get broken, and the cat will die. If it does not decay, the cat will live. But you may not know anything of this unless you open the box. So according to quantum physics hypothesis, in the box, as the box is closed and you cannot see anything inside the box, so we cannot say if the cat is dead or alive, but we can, we can believe the cat is both dead and alive. That's what the Schrodinger's explanation, of, that's what the Schrodinger's representation of superposition is, and his cat is still angry at it. Now next, next thing, a quantum entanglement. This is the second uh, phenomena that you use for uh, quantum physics. So superposition makes qubit interesting, but entanglement qubit uh, are uh, superpower of supercomputers or superpower of quantum computing. So what exactly is entanglement is according to Schrodinger, uh, there is a situation where two distant systems are in correlated superposition. You can see this high, uh, this uh, advanced equation that uh, wave function that two positions, the two phenomena are occurring at same time at distant position. But if you want to measure one super phenomena, you end up changing the other phenomena. That's what the complication of quantum physics is. So according to Schrodinger, the path of two phenomena are uh, totally correlated and uh, this is the same experiment of beam splitter using the photons so we can create an entangled state between two phenomena and make more complex calculations this is the simplified version of this entangled state of two photons with the equation phi is equal to a1 a2 plus b1 b2 and both of these states exist sim simultaneously Einstein couldn't really believe on this, or this was true. He couldn't really understand the entanglement of two states at the same, two of two distant system at the same time. So he called it the spooky action at the distance. But recent experiments like quantum computing have uh, verified the properties of, of entanglement. So it is being to have practical applications as well. 
So this is the result of a quantum entanglement that you can say that two physical phenomena or two quantum phenomena are to uh, tangled together in such a way that it can create multiple phenomena at the same time. So qubit represent different things. That's how the quantum computer using qubits can represent or process different things as simultaneously at the same time limit. This is another pictorial representation of superposition and entanglement. So this is what entanglement and superposition differentiate in between. This is simply a double superposition at the same time with two different particles. Now, what is the application of entanglement in quantum computing? So there are a lot of applications. If we use entanglement or entangle superposition, we can create teleportation. We can, uh, re we can create super dense coding, quantum key distribution, hologra multiple holographic systems, and many more that, can, that we cannot yet imagine if we achieve this quantum entanglement superposition up to its maximum limit. So uh, quantum mechanics is the foundation of physics, which underlies chemistry. So if you can see, all the sciences are related with each other. So it is the foundation of physics, which underlies chemistry, which is the foundation of biology. So if you, in simple word, if you want, if the scientists want to accurately simulate any of the phenomena in any of these physical science, scientific fields, they need better way of, a better and faster way of making calculation. And that can uh, handle the uncertainty between the situations. So that's where quantum computers come. So uh, I'm not going to go about the details of quantum computers application as of my fellow uh, speakers have clearly and uh, de in detail explained that, but we can say in simple uh, short, I can say that quantum computers will find use everywhere everywhere, literally in every scientific field in which you f we face the uh, behavior of individual electron and we uh, uh, face the uncertainty of calculation if the quantum computers become uh, a tool of scientific representation or calculation then it will be a whole new era of scientific world which could mean that efficient products from new materials new kind of battery and it can change the whole lifestyle that we right now have and also in nowadays scientists are hoping that quantum simulation might be able to find a cure for Alzheimer, disease like Alzheimer. So cryptography is also a very uh, good field in which quantum computers can thrive. That is because uh, the transmission of data, encrypted data from one part to the other because of quantum, uh, faster speed of quantum computing. So it's expensive. Uh, the conventional methods are slow. In, and they are expensive, but quantum computers can process the data in nanosecond speed, and, but it comes with a perk and that can put our all data at risk. So you can see that quantum physics have its impact on everything and it is not that much, uh, it, you can say, difficult to understand what is going on behind the quantum computing. It is simply the quantum physics of one atom moving from one part to another part of energy level and creating the energy uh, bridge in form of the proposition of the wave in between the movement from one part, ground state to the excited state. It is sim as simple as that. Thank you very much for listening. You can ask questions in chat if you want. Okay, where do, I, where do I go from here? Ma'am, uh, there is a question from Sayed Saad. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> He's asking that one question, uh, if this sort of quantum has not any fixed state, so mm -hmm. what will be communication pattern? An error check, for example, parity and CRC? Uh, uh, if you talk about the compute in the sense of computation in classical computers, what happens that you have a gap in between two switching points, right? To create a bit. So you don't know what is going on in between. 
and you lose a lot of time and you might uh, might be losing some of the data in between the procedure that's why our classical computing is so slow but when we talk about the quantum level when the particle is switching between in net in nanoseconds picosecond speed and it is switching between two states of energy you can imagine how small that can be so it is so fast for now you cannot exactly predict the error or you cannot exactly see what the size of error will be but i'm sure uh, i'm uh, certain that that size of error is not losing much of the data but the data that is very very small in size so in between the transition state of uh, the particle the data transfer where the wave nature or uh, the superposition of uh, the particle in between the movement it is carrying a lot more data and it is very early to say it right now that how much data will be lost because uh, we are not we are still at uh, uh, infant level for the quantum computers and we don't have quantum computers available for it so there is a possibility of loss of data in between the process but how small it is you cannot you do not have any procedure to uh, calculate that error yet does that answer my, your question please yeah ma'am perfect ma'am uh, one more question and that is i think last question from us right now that mm -hmm. what about sir richard Feynman theory on mm -hmm. quantum mechanic mm -hmm. uh there are, there is a large theory what about what exactly do you want to ask about this uh, about the theory actually it has been asked by anonymous name i don't know i cannot pronounce his name can you a uh, little bit exp uh, expand your question so that it is precise i think ma'am there is no context behind the question uh, it has been just written what about sir richard Feynman theory on quantum mechanic it in the chart section okay so uh Richard Feynman theory is one of the basic theories uh, that we have in quantum physics. So uh, all the theory that we have right now in quantum physics, they are kind of, uh, you can say, leading to a same uh, result. That is, that uh, in quantum physics, you can go for the probability and uncertainty, and you can say that the uncertainty gap can be filled. So Feynman uh, quite disagreed with a lot of theories of uh, with Heisenberg and Einstein, and uh, there is not a well, not lot more explanation. So there is a lot in Feynman's theory of uh, for quantum physics. So uh, I'm not sure what to answer to that question. As if it is precise, I might be able to put out the specific need of yeah. the answer yeah exactly there is no context uh any behind this question but we have to concern it okay ma'am thank okay. you so much i guess that we have to Should make I it stop sharing my screen now yeah not okay. yet as you did a wonderful <laughs> presentation right now and i personally admire this especially classical computer and the uh, physics behind and the concept that you celebrate very with perfection so i'm really glad to see that all right, I will see the speaker view now. Okay, yeah, now thanks. I can see the participants. There are the participants. So, Muhammad Shahbaz. I'm asking something. Yes. Yes. I want to know the quantum computing yes. works on qubits, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And qubits uh, on the principle of superposition. Yes. You get Right? Yes. And the qubits have one and zero. How come they superpose? Uh, qubits uh, have a one and zero. Uh, yeah. But uh, if we see that between one and zero at atomic level, there is not a no, uh, you can say, blank space. There is a way uh, we phenomena going on in between Q and zero. So, uh, that is where we find quantum computers more beneficial than classical ones, not exactly yeah. cancelling the classical one. The empty shoot, em yes. addition of empty shoot occurs, right? Yes. So if and it is a zero, get occur. 
uh, if we are talking about the superposition state in between the movement between zero and one, if the superposition is constructive, we can easily, uh, you can say, move, okay. Let me just, I cannot find Sheba's email ID. Yeah, I found so, it as one and zero. And last the week, one, uh, you yeah. can make a quantum computing host. There's an ID with the name of quantum computing. Yes. Yeah, you can make their me host. Okay, yes, I can make you host. All right, I'm making quantum computing host because I cannot see your email ID. Okay, I think I've done that. Yeah, you have done. Thank you. Okay, so for the answer of Ms. Aziz Fatma, uh, ma'am, uh, I obviously you all know better than me about the uh, quantum physics uh, than I know. So <laughs> in between superposition, what we are hoping in quantum computing is that when uh, the atom or when the particle is transitioning between one and zero, there is a superposition state in between, and we can make use of that superposition state, assuming that the superposition is a uh, constructive superposition. So if the if constructive, there is a lot more chance and a lot more uh, space for data uh, to travel through as compared to conventional compute travel, uh, data traveling. I hope this is the correct answer that you are looking for. Yeah, I have to study more because I could not understand why studying the superposition of the quantum so, so, sorry like, to, <clears throat> the example of sorry to interfere in this discussion uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, my understanding right. my my understanding for the superposition is that uh, we calculate the probability of the state which and based on that probability we we identify what the state exactly is mm -hmm. and based on that we say because we can have different values for the probability then for the same integral superposition we can have different states Yes. So basically, what I, my understanding is based on the calculation of pro probability. Yes. And that superposition based on the probability, we can have different states of the same. So it's based probabilistic. Yes. Yeah, when uh, obviously at quantum state level, you cannot uh, do the exact. Uh, you can say mark of the position or exact marking of the state or the position of the particle. So if you are taking a, a quantum state or quantum level of the computing, you have to go for the probability. And uh, I think probability is the be best can define at this stage. Yeah, there's more complication okay. probability. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you all. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, I yeah, want I to say something. I want to say something that uh, Surpuram Hussain, uh, yes. actually he is the founder of Quantum Computing Club. Mm -hmm. And he gathered us, uh, me personally, Momo Shabazz, Mozam, Migdad, and we six people's students who is a part of Kennedy University. Surpuram mm -hmm. Hussain gathered us and uh, uh, deal with us that we have to work on quantum computing. And still he is struggling a lot. He's, uh, uh, pushing us to work on the and the research on the quantum computing and he is making us capable uh, to win the badge from IBM quantum computing challenge 2020 and sir we are really proud to be find you here right now thank you so much for being with us you are our power and thank you we are ready proud of you okay, guys thanks for your all of your efforts and uh, finding uh, uh, mentor like Nazish to come and uh, educate, uh, educate us on the subject. Uh, so it's all your efforts. Uh, I just understand one thing that to organize people is very important in order for them to perform. And uh, if we and what I tried to do before this, we started with the uh, artificial intelligence club. Basically, that's motivated me to start quantum uh, computing. In 2017, I I'm an alumni of NAD from 2004. So uh, I went to NAD and I was discussing with Dean. He, he used to be my, uh, my teacher as well when I was studying. And I found that artificial, there is no artificial intelligence based courses. There's no artificial intelligence or data science department. And it was a bit, it was not just surprising. It was shocking for me in 2017. So I started how to fix it. Like uh, we did, st starting a new 
development or in a bureaucratic system is not so easy even in introducing a few courses so artificial intelligence club i started it was sort of a um, cry for help but the response from the students what i understood from the students that the students are looking for motivation guidance and platform and if you provide these three are very active uh, compared to many conventional they and with the availability of the online courses and online method of interaction like zoom and um, uh, online meetings they, we can create a lot of big things uh, so what we tried to do in the ai club was to create uh, to close out the gap between uh, what, uh, what academics at nad is not able to provide for a certain time later on nad did introduce three more uh, artificial intelligence courses uh but uh, things are things technology is moving a lot faster than uh, we are moving right so i was studying about the quantum computer after that and uh, say that the world will be the same place in next 10 15 years it's a matter of time uh, theoretically people say that uh, the big governments of the world already have uh, 60 qubit quantum computers and they are using to if you have a 60 qubit quantum computer you can pretty much decipher any encryption system in the world right so so uh, it's it said that the big governments already have a uh, qubit uh, 60 bit uh, 60 qubit quantum computing system uh, and they are using it to control the world whatever it is so this is the next uh, new technology uh, and uh, if, if the understand that who will achieve the first they will have uh, they'll have all the powers uh, in the information world uh, application as you guys have already explained it I won't go like what application it can do and what magic it can do uh, for the world and the computation that's uh, that's another subject so uh, um, our ambitious goal this team is to fund program to create a quantum computer it can be initially two to four bit eight bit quantum computer but uh, that is ambitious goal uh, with this covid 19 situation and the students not going to the university so a lot of lab facilities are not available for them and they cannot coordinate so that has slowed down the process but uh, our ultimate goal is to have uh, develop a quantum computer um, maybe how simple it is how uh it is the thing is we have to develop a computer and what is our objective is i as everybody everybody is busy i'm so busy i have very little time for mikta tikra mozam to talk to them even but these guys are fantastic right they arrange this all the that's not my idea this whole team is doing a wonderful job they find the time and energy and their love for the technology and share the knowledge is great and um, i hope i can find a team which uh, we can find in form of some research facility in at nad and convert it into a research project which is goes on for next five ten years and we find the funding for that and uh, but it all depends like are we able to create something in next one to two years uh, which is a uh, basic uh quantum computer which maybe the world has already built we don't care about that, that are we able to build it right uh, and find uh, new methods uh, of encryption and uh, cryptography and other things whatever it can do. Uh, of course our challenge is uh, uh, is the bureaucracy at our university entity and uh, we want to circumvent that uh, bureaucracy and we will circumvent that bureaucracy. but the thing is are we able to find uh, a reliable team which who are to, because in such projects you have to make a lot of sacrifices and uh, uh, a lot of pressure comes to you from your family that what are you doing this is a research project that will not go nowhere you can find a better job you can go there so which there is there is a lot of things so i have not discussed those ideas um, we will at some point uh, definitely discuss it i really like uh, nazish uh, uh, I, I went through your presentation uh, it's wonderful work and thanks a lot 
for sharing uh, such a complex subject in such a simple language with us. It's really difficult. There's a lot of mathematics behind it. There's a lot of a lot of things behind it. Maybe we can find a focus group and we can create a focus group to discuss that so that people who want to go to the next level, but it will be your time and your efforts. But thanks a lot. Thank you a lot. I cannot be grateful more than that. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I was sent the introduction. Azish, can you give me a brief introduction to all everybody because a lot of people join late, including me. So we can. Sorry, have... sir, I can. Uh, I cannot hear you. What did you say? I said uh, to Nazish, if uh, because a lot of people like me join uh, later, so can we have a little introduction about you, like uh, what you have been doing and where uh, are you coming from? Uh, well, I will say I'm a simple physicist, uh, and I'm here. Uh, the reason of me being here is mostly because of my teachers, Professor Aziz Fatma Hasnan, who have been asking questions. And you can understand it, it is a very hard task to ask, uh, answer the questions of your teachers. So I am a member of Center for, I have been working with Center for Physics Education for a long time now. And basically, I am a lecturer in Pakistan. Uh, Previously at Sunjadas College for Women, and now I am uh, posted at Upper Government uh, College for Women. But right now I am in England uh, as a postgrad researcher, PhD researcher at University of Hull, England. So that's all my introduction is. Yeah, okay. So I have I have just one question. So what do you <laughs> see in the world like? How they are approaching their uh, at um, in England? How they are approaching their development? What are their development objectives? Main development objectives and what the, what they are trying to achieve using quantum. Mm, the only difference uh, related to quantum physics or quantum mechanics or uh, in so quantum general computer, computer quantum computing. It's like how. Mm. The main thing, the main difference between uh, Pakistan or uh, any other country in uh, UK and other developed country is that they are more uh, depending and emphasizing on research that certainly uh, uh, many of countries are not doing that. So the quantum computing is a fancy subject here as well, but it is also uh, at this, you can say, Fortunately, it is at the same level here as well as in Pakistan that you are understand uh, the level of understanding in Pakistan or uh, the QCC group students have achieved. It is the same here everywhere for now all over the world. So I cannot say because I'm not a, com a quantum physicist or I'm not a quantum computer specialist. So I have not been in touch with them a lot, but as a general implementation, they are not very far ahead of us. So that's a good start. If uh, other countries start it right away, it won't be a loss or it won't be a very uh, delayed response to quantum computing, okay. so, I would say. So there's no functional quantum computer in England? That's what you say? Uh, not to my knowledge, uh, the only quantum computer they're using is uh, of that IBM. And um, there might be some that uh, are in, in process that I have to go through the literature and I have to go through the details of it. But uh, right now, I think everyone is at the same level as okay. others. So, so but, but in, in US, they have, uh, in the US, I know the project, in the, one project in Israel, uh, yes, they they have a, they are very advanced level. There is like one project. This. There is one project that uh, is uh, that uh, is known in UK about quantum computer. That is, I think it is going on about in uh, university Queen Mary University. It is a joint project with the seismic control units and IBM. So it is a collaborated project. Every not country specific so where they are wherever they are doing the research and uh, development in quantum computing they are collaborating they're not doing it separately so you can like google google has their own uh, manage and run program ibm had their own program uh, yes in, um, amazon they might have one own. they might have one because i'm not into this field so i might not have that information that you require so let's uh, i will have to search for it more <laughs> Okay. So our ambitious project project is to develop a quantum computer uh, with the help of the team and develop a team. 
uh, the least is we'll have a team of people who will know about quantum computer and they will have a knowledge and the basic information of our uh, basic structural level. And our, our ambitious goal is uh, that to build a quantum computer with the help of the team. I really hope for, from this team a lot. Uh, I was just, we were just had an initial phase and we will just, we'll have this discussion. This, it has been, there is a slowdown, but uh, we'll have this discussion. So Nazish, thanks for your time and efforts. And okay, we'll sir. This presentation once again, and thanks a lot for whole team, Wazam, Migda, the Ikra, and whole team. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Kunal Hussain and Ms. Nazish Fatma for your tremendous presentation that you have been done before. And now it's Very time. Good to, and it's time to Thank end you, the Mama session. Please. <laughs> it's time to end the session. Uh, those people who have been uh, who have registered in this session, uh, the certificates by the CPE will be awarded to you all through via email. So please wait for this. And inshallah, we are coming with the series of webinar soon. This is the part one and the part two in which we will going to expand more uh, clearly about quantum computing terminologies and many things more. You have to wait for this as well. And uh, that's all from my side, from our team, from CPE, and from founder of Quantum Computing Club. Inshallah, we will join you further. Thank you so much for being with us. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Thank you all for listening. Thanks,